Well, I'm driving through the old neighborhood, and I do mean old. We lived in this neighborhood when I was a kid, moved out of here in 1963 when I was 12 years old. So that kind of gives you a sense of the time scale. Earlier on, there was a guy who had a car garage just right up here, or heading over there right now. Ethel Graham, he called it Canyon Motors, and he kept our car running and worked on a lot of the cars around the neighborhood here. But the cool part of that was that Ethel was building a hot rod, and it wasn't just any old hot rod, it was a salt flats car, a land speed record car, which he fully intended to take up to 400 miles an hour and beyond and be the first human being to ever drive a car faster than 400 miles an hour. Oh, well his shop is right up here, and we're just gonna walk in there and see what develops. Seems to be a snowboard shop these days. Hi. How's it going? It's going really well. I just thought I'd share a story with you if you're down with it. I would love to hear one. I used to live just just like a couple blocks over here. Yeah. And this was a car shop. It was called Canyon Motors. Okay. And this guy, Ethel Graham, ran this place. And the coolest part is he was <laughs> building a hot rod just, just right over here by the Adidas shoes and uh, right along in there. And he said he was going to get it up over 400 miles an hour. It was a land speed record car. Wow. And it spliced together parts out of two airplanes, a P-38 and uh, a P-51. Wow. And he said it was going to go 400 miles an hour. And, you know, we were just kids. We'd come over and he'd fire it up and it would just make this incredible racket. And, you know, it was just, it was a car garage. So there'd be cars over in this area here that he'd be working on and then the hot rod back there and he finally took it out to the salt flats and he got it up to like 350 miles an hour or something like that wow. and people said this guy might actually make 400 because he didn't have his foot in it and he got it up to 350 yeah, yeah. miles an hour so suddenly he got sponsors and they painted the car which they'd never done it had been bare metal up to that point no way they painted it bright red and stp and andy granatelli and firestone tires it became a really big deal and the next summer he took it out to the salt flats got the thing up ostensibly to 400 miles an hour he didn't get through the measured mile because the car blew up oh, no way. but the timer said he was he was definitely going more than 400 miles an hour and the car blew up and scattered down the salt and he was killed. Wow. And we heard about it and it was like we came back over here and his wife had brought the car back here. The parts of it? The parts of it and the, the wreck of the frame was sitting where it usually did, but all the way around all the walls in here were pieces of the car. They were sorting through it all, trying to figure out what was there and what wasn't. And there was salt covering everything. Uh, it's like freaky. Do you what, do you what do you say to the guy's wife, you know? And but I wanted to see the car, and I wanted to find out what they were going to do with the car. So we just came over here, and she was here, and the car was here, and it was just it was just freaky, freaky weird. I was uh, that was 1959, so I was uh, eight eight years old. Now one of the guys that worked on the car back then was this young man that really put his heart and soul into the car and uh, for that and, and a variety of other reasons, he was really heartbroken that the car had crashed and, and that Ethel had been killed, but he wanted to rebuild the car. He wanted to rebuild it and he wanted to run it himself. Well, not a lot of people were too keen on that idea, but the guy also had terminal leukemia. And it was like, well, okay, I mean, if that's what he really wants to do, let him do it. So they hauled the car up to Ethel's house. They were gonna close down the garage. And they took the car up to the uh, house, and this kid went to work rebuilding it, getting it ready for the salt. And uh, it took him a while, but he got the thing going, and he got it back out to the salt flats, and he was gonna try to make his own speed run but the sanctioning body was saying, excuse me, you've never even driven a car, okay? 
and certainly not a race car, and we're just not okay with it. So they made him demonstrate that he could drive the thing, and then they said, well, okay, you know, whatever. If, if, uh, if you want to go for it, go for it. But he blew the tires on the car, never was able to make a speed run with it, and never got back out to the salt because he died a short time later from the leukemia. Anyway, the car disappeared. It actually went off to Las Vegas. The engine was pulled out of it and stuck into a boat, and the car left out in a field to just sort of disintegrate and fall apart. But Butch Graham, Ethel's son, now I had met him when we were kids, but you know, he was he was four, I was eight. Come on, you don't you don't hang out in those kinds of circumstances. But we'd both been around the shop. I'd actually been over to their house and whatnot. So I kind of had seen Butch around, didn't know anything about him. Butch got the car some 30 years ago and decided he was going to rebuild it and put it back together the way his dad had it. My mom gave me the thing about 30 years ago and I started taking it apart. And then about that time she sold the shop I was renting from her and the house I was renting from her. And so I ended up in this place and I bought this place specifically for this car. <laughs> Every now and again I'd dig it out and get something done on it. And then in uh, 2009 my back went to pot. So I, I said, now's my chance. And I went after it and got all the body work done, got all that done and unveiled it on uh, uh, August 1st or actually August, not quite August 1st, the 31st of July on that one. but. Got it as close as we could for a Mormon family that doesn't do anything on Sundays. But it's, it was a long, long process. I basically spent almost the whole year of 2010 getting it to this point, you know, from that point on. And it's, uh, boy, it's sure been a project. It's been amazing to see the, how many people my dad touched because that just, that just blew me away. I was really amazed at how many people uh, showed up when all that went down. But uh, they were coming out of the woodwork. I, I mean, I phone calls from Germany and, and Canada and people doing books and stories and articles. <laughs> it was, I was really overwhelmed for, for quite a while when this first got, got out that it was being done. It just seemed to me the thing to do when, when you get a piece of history like this, I, I, the, my dad built it so simply, so simply, that I look at these cars today and I just go, oh my God, you're losing so much power in your transmissions and your shifts and your gears and your, all this complicated crap. He just made the thing so simple, torque converter on the back of that big Allison straight into a one-to-one -one rear end and that's put the pedal down and go. <laughs> that's all it really came to. There's a lot of opinions on what caused the accident in the first place, and some people have said a tire blew out, but the Firestone tires are righteous. The only really good eyewitness said he saw the rear hatch come open, and that caused the car to become airborne. The one guy that came and sat down with me said that he was doing at least 400 miles an hour when the, when the tail dislodged and the car took off. Uh, and this is somebody who'd been out on the salt and seen a lot of people go, a lot of people run, and seen a lot of 200 mile, 300 mile an hour cars. He didn't believe in taking small steps, didn't believe in, you know, didn't have the money really to take a lot of runs and learn a lot about it. So it was just fit it in and go. And literally, I think that's what killed him. I mean, he just didn't have the knowledge and the understanding of what he was getting himself into to make it all happen. I asked Butch about Otto Ansjohn and his rebuilding of the car and his attempt to drive the car himself. And so they spent two years rebuilding the car and uh, it uh, was able to go out and run it to 254 miles an hour. Uh, got through the licensing, they said go ahead, go for it. And he got so excited he spun the rear wheels so hard but he blew the back tires out and that was the end of Speed Week and the end of their money and, and everything. And a couple months later, I do believe he fell over dead. But uh, kept him alive for a couple years and uh, fulfilled his dream of, of being able to run the car. And I got to pat my mom on the back for that one because that took an awful lot to do that after all that she'd been through. 
So back when I walked into Ethel's shop and laid that story on those guys, well, they turned around and laid a really interesting story on me. So Dmitry Milovich, um, so he's the, he was the starter of, of Milo Sport. And um, back in uh, late 1960s is when uh, he started making snowboards. Um, and he would just make them for friends and people that would hear about them in uh, the, the newspaper or the Playboy magazine articles and stuff where they produce stuff about snowboarding. And then in, uh, he eventually made enough money from uh, making the snowboards in his garage that he was able to buy this place and start Milo in 1984. And then that's when he really started making the first good quality snowboards. This one here, this round tail up there, um, uh, Winter Stick is one, one of the first ones that he had uh, ever made there in the back. And um, yeah, it's an awesome board. And Winter Stick kind of just developed from here. Um, Dimitri owned this shop um, well into the 90s. And then now the, uh, the current owner, Cal Egbert, he bought it in uh, 1996. Dmitry Milovich turns out to be something of a legend in the world of snowboarding. He was one of the developers of the snowboard back in the 60s. So they're actually used to having people come in here and shoot video and stills because of all the history that the building has in the world of snowboarding. The winter stick that Milo developed is still manufactured. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what we can say about all of this. A lot of very, very extreme screwing around, life-threatening screwing around in many cases. People who are just driven to do something that's so completely over the top that they're willing to risk their life doing it. And you might say, gee, that's, that's kind of insane. But you know, we all know that we are terminal. We all know that we have a certain amount of time on this earth and to have a desire to do as much screwing around as we possibly can in the amount of time allotted, when you get right down to it, is the meaning of life. And these guys, uh, whether they're the snowboarders or the car racers, are all doing kind of the same thing in a way. And that's really really pushing the envelope, really trying to do just massive, massive amounts of screwing around. And in the end, this changes everything. It changes the whole nature of life. The first person to look at an automobile undoubtedly took a look at that and said, hey, that's kind of cool. I, I want to get one of those, not because they wanted to see our society move forward and freeways be built and highways be built and traffic lights like this one get put in and all of that sort of thing. No, they just saw a car and it sounded like a pretty fun thing to do and gee, can I afford to get one of those because I want to go screw around with that thing. And it sort of has driven our whole society, this desire to screw around and even risk our lives screwing around. Well, if you, if you haven't been over to the channel, pop on over to the channel and subscribe, of course. The link is right down here, unless you're in full screen. Uh, and you can go to the channel and you can subscribe. Or you could just pop over to toymantelevision.com, the website, and from there you can link back to the channel, you can subscribe, you can go to Facebook, you can like me on Facebook, and you can do all of those fun and interesting and wonderful things. I'm not sure how you found this movie on the internet. I'm sure hoping you didn't find it boring. And I'll see you here again in exactly one week with another fine example of screwing around. I'll see you then. Bye.